If you have your Bible, go ahead and find the Gospel of Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. We've been working through Colossians, but this morning we're going to take a break with the holiday and talk on the subject of resting in Christ from Matthew chapter 11. One of our favorite places to go back when we lived in Atlanta, Georgia area was the Georgia Aquarium. I don't know if you've ever been to the Georgia Aquarium or if you enjoy an aquarium, but if you've not been and you like aquariums, fish, you've got to go. It's the number one aquarium in America, according to TripAdvisor, if you believe what TripAdvisor says. And it is a fascinating experience. They've got whale sharks, beluga whales, Penguin, octopus, octopi, however you say that, massive hammerhead sharks, all kinds of amazing sea creatures, and they even have overpriced souvenirs. You have to walk through the gift shop on your way out, amen? But you know, when you think about that aquarium or other aquariums across the United States, there's one thing you won't find in any aquarium, and that is the great white shark. Which is startling, because if you think about it, what's the one thing you would love to see in an aquarium? A great white shark, that king of predators, that terrifying creature, that, that subject of the movie Jaws, right? A great white shark would be amazing, but you won't find one in any aquarium. Many aquariums have tried, but it just didn't last very long. The sharks had trouble swimming, they wouldn't eat. The longest anyone managed to keep a great white in an aquarium was 16 days prior to 2004. Monterey Bay Aquarium in 2004 in California kept one for six months. It took a massive effort, and it's never been tried since. They had a big tank 35 feet deep, a relatively small great white shark only four feet long, but they ultimately had to release it. After it killed two of the other sharks, despite the high attendance. Can you imagine being there on that day? Look at the shark, kids. Oh my goodness, the blood. Hide the kids. Now, what's the issue there? Well, fish need water continually passing through their gills to get oxygen. Most fish open their mouths to pump the water through. Right? If you think of a fish, they're always doing what? But you know what doesn't do that? Great white sharks. Why? The teeth. There's no way. And so, great white sharks, not being able to pump water through their mouths, need to constantly move forward to breathe. And so when you put them in a tank, they ultimately develop sores from bumping into the sides. And when they live in the open ocean, great whites travel very long distances. And interestingly enough, great whites don't really sleep. In fact, for the longest time, scientists didn't even think great whites ever slept. It wasn't until they spotted one drifting in a current, catching a brief power nap, that they realized they do occasionally rest and sleep. But for the most part, great whites are continuously on the move. You and I, on the other hand, we were designed for rest. We were not designed like great whites to continuously move and never stop. We were designed to need sleep. We were designed to need rest. But oftentimes, life feels like it never stops. We can never get enough done. We're constantly on the move. We're being crushed by our schedule and the notifications on our phone. There's always another game. There's always another chore. There's always another task that needs to be done. There's always another social to attend. And then the car battery dies, and you got to take care of that. It seems like life never gives us a break. Do we ever truly find rest? Because the things we do find never seem to be enough. The vacation's not enough. Netflix is not enough. Saturday is not enough. But Jesus, in Matthew 11, invites us to experience true rest rest. The question for you and for me today is, are we living in that rest? Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 11. We're going to begin in verse 25. 
where we find these words. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So at this moment in Jesus' ministry, he takes a time out. He kind of steps away from all that he's been doing, and he makes a declaration, a prayer that Matthew records for us here that explains Jesus' ministry. Jesus has been been performing miracles and he's been teaching and people have been responding or not responding. And so this, in a way, is Matthew's moment to kind of give a disclaimer on Jesus' ministry, to give an explanation for how things are unfolding. And what Jesus is basically saying here through this prayer is that some people receive Jesus and his ministry and some people reject Jesus and his ministry and that both of these are according to God's plan. Both of these are according to God's plan. And the key difference between those who receive the ministry and those who reject Jesus is not intellectual. It's not that some people have figured it out and other people haven't. Jesus says you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. It's not moral. It's not that some people obey the law of God and have it together and some people don't. The primary difference is a recognition of need. A recognition of need. You have revealed these things not to the wise understanding, not to the morally upright. You have revealed these things to little children. And what's distinctive about little children? Little children are constantly in need. The difference between those who receive Jesus and those who reject him is the ones that receive him realize that they need him. That they need him. I remember years ago, I was preaching at a camp in Alabama, and some leaders from one of the churches that was attending the camp came up to me, and they said, we have this girl in our group. She's 16 years old, and she's been in our church. She grew up in our church, but now she's drifting away, and she is asking a lot of tough questions that we don't have the answers to. Would you mind sitting down and having a conversation with her? And I said, oh, absolutely. I would love to. But in my mind, I was thinking, you've come to the right person. I, I'm interested in apologetics, the defense of the faith. I've read all the books. I know all the answers. I'm ready for whatever she throws at me. So I went into that conversation with two barrels loaded full of facts and figures that I was preparing to unload on her until eventually she waved the white flag and admitted that Jesus is the way. So we sat down. She began to ask her questions. She said, I just don't know if there's a God or that he exists. I said, oh, 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 let me give you all the arguments for the existence of God. She said, I just don't know if I can believe the Bible. It's so old. It's been translated. And I said, oh, let me give you all the reasons that you can believe the Bible is true and accurate. She said, I just don't know if Jesus rose from the dead. Oh, oh, let me give you all the evidences for the resurrection. And after 30 minutes, she was unimpressed. She was unmoved. And I had unloaded all the ammunition that I brought to our conversation. And then she said, you know what I think it really is? I got a good life. I have parents that love me. I have good friends. I'm a cheerleader. I make good grades. I'm going to college. I got a great future ahead. I just don't see why I need God. Why do I need him? And see, that's the problem that a lot of us face. There are some people who have it all together. They are morally upright. They have done a good job obeying the rules and disciplining their life. There are other people who are successful. They have achieved their goals. They have gotten on top. There are other people who are wealthy. They have more than enough resources. There are other people who are connected. There are a lot of people who support them. Their response to the demands of God's law And to the requirements of the world is, I can do it. I've got this. But there are others whose response to God's law and the demands of the world is, I can't do it. I need help. And to those who recognize their need, Jesus says 
simply come. Come. Look at the next verse. Verse 28. Jesus says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, what rest is Jesus talking about? He's not talking about three nights at the Holiday Inn Express. What he means here, first and foremost, within the context, he means rest from the burden of God's law. Rest from the burden of having to live up to God's standard. Because what does God's law say? You must do enough to be accepted. Thou shalt not and thou shall. And you better do them all. And it's burdensome. And most people could not live up to its exacting standard. And so Jesus says, come to me and you will find rest. Why will we find rest from the burden of having to follow God's law to the letter? Because Jesus followed it to the letter. Jesus perfectly followed the law of God. And then when he went to the cross where he traded places with us and gave us his perfect record. And what that means is that now you and I, regardless of our performance, are accepted by God. He loves us and accepts us just as much on our worst day as he does on our best day. Because Jesus has perfectly obeyed the law and we can rest in him. But I also think in view here is rest from the world. Secondarily, rest from the world. See, the world also looks at us and says, you must do enough to be accepted. You must be smart enough, attractive enough, talented enough, likable enough, successful enough, rich enough. You must meet all of the expectations. And if you did it right last week, you better do it better this week. The world is constantly demanding more for, uh, from us. But Jesus looks at us and says, you are enough as you are. I loved you and died for you while you were still sinners, while you were weak, while you were ungodly. I love you. And so you can come and find rest in me. Rest from the law and rest from the world. Now, Jesus talks about practically how we receive that rest in verse 29. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now, long back ago in ancient times, if you were in agriculture, and many people were, and you wanted to plow a field, you had to go out there and you had to plow it yourself. And then some genius came along and said, you know what would be a lot easier than plowing this field myself? Finding an animal to do it. And so sure enough, they hooked up a plow to an ox, and the ox would plow the field. But the ox would get tired. You'd wear out your ox. You could only plow so much. Then someone said, what if we had two ox plowing the field at one time? That's brilliant. But how is that going to work? What if one pulls harder than the other? One goes in a different direction than the other? How are we going to solve this? And that's when a, an inventor came up with the idea of a yoke. A yoke fits across the shoulder of your oxen. And it keeps them locked together so that they pull together. They each benefit from the strength of the other. You hook yourself up. You hook the oxen up together and they pull and plow the field. And so Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. Yoke yourself to me. Benefit from my strength. Hook your life to my life. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. It was also a phrase used by rabbis. It would describe the relationship of a student to a Jewish rabbi, a Jewish teacher. A Jewish student would take the yoke of the rabbi's teachings upon themselves. They would hook themselves up to that rabbi and learn the rabbi's way of life, the rabbi's understanding of the law, the rabbi's teachings, and they would live according to those. I think both things are in view here. Jesus is saying, yoke yourself to me. Hook your life up to me. Because anything else that you hook yourself to, and let's be honest, we're all going to yoke ourselves to something. We're all going to hook ourselves up, hook our life up to something. Anything that we yoke ourselves to 
other than Jesus will take more than it gives, will disappoint us, and will leave us exhausted. When I was a kid, I loved baseball. I still love baseball, but especially as a kid. I played baseball in the fall and the spring. I collected baseball cards, spent way too much money on little square cardboard uh, cards with baseball players on them. I played baseball video games. I had posters of my favorite baseball players on the wall. I loved baseball. There was only one catch. I wasn't a very good hitter. I mean, I gave it my best, and I spent a lot of time in the batting cage, but hitting was definitely not my strength. And if you're not going to be a great hitter, the other great path to glory in baseball is to be a great pitcher. Right? Maybe I can't hit well, but maybe I can pitch good. So I worked tirelessly to become a better pitcher. I practiced for hours and hours and hours. I would pitch with anybody who would catch with me, and I pleaded with the coach to give me a chance. Well, I worked my way up, and finally I had my chance at pitching. And I will still remember one of my first games. I was on the mound. I had made it through the first inning pretty well. But then the second inning came. They got a runner on base. And up to the plate came Kevin. Kevin was one of those kids who was shaving at the age of 12. His pregame snack had been one of his teammates. Like, I mean, I'm talking just... That you're like, you're, there's no way that this kid fits within the age range right here. But he came up and he towered over the catcher and he stood in that box. And I thought, this is the moment. I'm going to get Kevin out. So I wound up and I fired the best pitch that I had right at home plate. Kevin swung and we never saw that ball again. <laughs> he launched that thing so far it was over the fence and all I could do was stand and watch it. And that moment rattled me, so I gave up a few more runs. And that game was a disastrous loss for our team. I don't remember how many runs the, uh, that we scored, but I still remember the 29 that the other team hung on us. And let me tell you, for those of you who don't know, that is not a baseball score. <laughs> That's a football score. It was the beginning of the end of my pitching career. Let me tell you this. Whatever you decide to do with your life, there's always a Kevin. There's always a Kevin. You have great aspirations for your career. And you go to school and you work hard. But then you deal with corporate management. And they just won't move you beyond your present position. You have your designs on owning that perfect home in the perfect neighborhood with a perfect interior decorating. You've got it all mapped out and planned out. But then the mortgage comes in and you're getting crushed under the weight of that monthly payment. You've looked for your worth and your value and being beautiful and being attractive. But every time there's another wrinkle or another pound, you die a small death inside. You decided that religion was going to be your way. You were going to, to clean up your life. You were going to do what was expected. You were going to measure up. You were going to follow all the rules. But it's crushing you under the burden of having to live up to everyone's standard and everyone's expectation, especially God's. Jesus comes along and says to us, wherever we find ourselves, in whatever we've yoked our lives to, he says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Verse 30, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You'll find rest in him from whatever you yoke yourself to, from whatever you've hooked yourself to. Rest is ultimately found in Christ. And why is rest found in him? Because he cares and because he is good. Let's see those things. The story continues in chapter 12. When Jesus steps up and he says, I am rest, that's going to bring him into conflict with, in the Old Testament, the definition of rest, which is found in something called the Sabbath. Chapter 12, verse 1. 
At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look what your disciples are doing. They're doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Now, a little bit of background here. The Sabbath is the seventh day of the week. It's the Saturday. It is a day of holy rest from God based on Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, where on the seventh day of creation, God rested. This rest that God enjoyed on the seventh day of creation in Genesis is then legislated to God's people in Exodus chapter 20 as a requirement for the nation of Israel as they're about to enter the promised land. Enter the Pharisees. These were the religious all-stars of Jesus' day. They very scrupulously kept the law that had been handed down from Moses. The disciples are walking through the grain fields. They pick heads of grain. They roll it. They eat it. And the Pharisees see it and they say, Aha! Your disciples are breaking the law, Jesus. Now, are they breaking the law? Maybe. Maybe. In reality, they're breaking what's called the oral law, the Mishnah. These are all the rules and regulations that had grown up over the years around the Mosaic law that God had handed down to Moses. And in the oral law, held very closely by the Pharisees, there are 39 things that are prohibited on the Sabbath day. Among those are things like preparing a meal, threshing, reaping. It's possible that the, fair, that the disciples are in violation of several of those things as they have a little snack of grain on the Sabbath day. Jesus responds with some moments from Scripture. Verse 3. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? So Jesus takes it back to the Old Testament, speaks of a specific incident in the life of King David where he was on the run. He was starving to death. They came to the tabernacle and there was bread there that was only to be eaten by the priests. But because David and his companions were starving and near death, the priests give the bread to David. The bread, it was unlawful for him to eat and he eats it and God's okay with it. Why? Well, David is God's anointed king and he's starving to death. Then he gives another example. Verse 5. Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? In other words, in the law there are priests. They do the work of the temple. And guess what? While they're working on the Sabbath, it's okay because they're doing the service of God. Now, what's interesting about both of these examples is that in this case, the life of the disciples is not in danger. They're not about to die from lack of food. And also the disciples are not priests doing the work in the temple. So what makes this an exception to the rule? Well, Jesus goes on and tells us in verse 6, I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. What makes this moment special, what makes this moment different, is that something greater than the temple is here. What does that mean? The temple is the dwelling place of God on earth. It's the home of his presence. What on earth could be greater than the temple? What on earth could be greater than King David? Well, the man doing the talking, actually. Jesus Christ. The very presence of God in human flesh. The very descendant of King David. That is who is speaking. That is the one who is greater. And he's the one who is here, and he is the Lord of the Sabbath. Verse 7, if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. I am the one in charge. I tell you how the Sabbath is to be interpreted. And you know what I say, Jesus says? You know what I say? I say it's okay for my disciples to have a snack. If you knew what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, Jesus quotes the Old Testament law. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. The point, man was not created for the law, he'll say elsewhere, but law for the man. These guys are hungry. Let them have a bite to eat. You're missing the whole spirit. I will tell you how to understand the Sabbath. And I say, 
they can have a snack. I care more about their well-being. I desire mercy rather than sacrifice. Jesus cares for us. He cares that we get a snack. He cares that our needs are met. He cares so much more than we could ever know. And he says the point of the Sabbath is for the good of God's people. And right now the good of these disciples is they have a bite to eat. But not only does God care, not only does Jesus care, but he is also good. That's why he's rest. The story continues. It's still the Sabbath day. Verse 9. He went on from there and entered their synagogue. And a man was there with a withered hand. And they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Again, this man's life is not in danger. He's not going to die from this withered hand. He's not been able to use this hand probably for many years. And so therefore, the Pharisees are saying, shouldn't this wait till the next day? It's not that much of a priority that this man be healed right now today on the Sabbath. After all, a healing would count as work, wouldn't it? And we're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. Jesus responds in verse 11. He said to them, Which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. He says, let me just use an example from something you've done. Your sheep falls in a pit. You don't say, well, you know what? We can drag that sheep out of the pit on Sunday or on Monday morning. No, you pull him out right there. Of how much more value is a man's life than a sheep? If you're willing to do that for a sheep, how much more should we do good on the Sabbath? Jesus doesn't debate the law. He doesn't enter into the minutia or the finer points. He just said it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Because the Sabbath is for the good of God's people. I'm the one who can tell you how to understand it. And so what does he do? Verse 13. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out. And it was restored, healthy, like the other. He was made whole. See, sadly, man's Sabbath, man's rest would have left this man broken and unhealed. But Jesus' rest restored this man wholly and completely. You know, there's a lot of ways that we pursue rest. There's a lot of ways that we pursue restoration. We plan that week at the beach or the theme park if we like a vacation where there's less rest and more excitement. We might play video games, watch our favorite show or a movie. We might scroll on our phone looking for different kinds of entertainment or distraction. We might enjoy a holiday like July 4th. We might sleep in. But you know the thing about all these different things that we pursue rest in, ultimately they don't offer restoration. Not the way Jesus does. You can schedule a week at the beach or at the theme park or in the mountains. But guess what? Eventually the vacation ends and you have to get back to normal life. You can distract yourself with your show, your movie, your game, your app. But eventually reality has to return. You can enjoy your holiday, but the holiday ends and you got to wait months until the next one. You can sleep in. But eventually you have to wake up. All the ways that we pursue rest in this life ultimately fall short. They don't fit the bill. They don't meet our deepest needs. They're incomplete. But the the rest that Jesus offers restores and heals completely. The rest that he extends to us goes down deep into our bones because he is good and because he cares. At the end of the day, we can exist like great white sharks, and many of us do. Constantly moving, constantly doing, constantly achieving, constantly crossing things off of our list, constantly staying busy, constantly being connected. But it's an exhausting way to live, and it's not the way that we were ultimately designed. The alternative is we can accept Jesus' invitation to rest 
in him. To know that he has met the demands of God's law and he is greater than the demands of this world. We can accept his invitation to rest in him because he cares and he is good and he is the one that we ultimately need. He is the one for whom we were ultimately made. Years ago, my best friend got married in the state of Colorado. And my parents decided that they were going to fly up and be part of the wedding. They, they were family friends. We had gone back many years. And so they flew up to Colorado to join us for the wedding. And they were going to be there a few days afterwards. And they said, is there something fun that we can all do together? Something adventurous, something outdoors for an extra day or two in Colorado? I thought about it and I said, well, we could always hike to the top of one of Colorado's famous 14,000 foot mountains. And they said, that sounds great. So I selected one of the easier ones, a, a peak called uh, Handy's Peak. And I told my folks, I said, now you need to make sure that you rent a car that's got a little bit of ground clearance because we're going to have to go up, you know, kind of an off-road Jeep road to get there. I said, all right. So the day of the wedding came. My parents showed up, and the car that they had rented was this car right here, a 2005 Chevy Malibu. And I said, that is not an off-road vehicle, as you can clearly see. I said, what happened to you? You couldn't have gotten a Jeep or, or a truck? And they said, well, we looked at that, and the prices were more expensive. This was cheaper, so we went with this. Can we still go? I said, well, we can try. And so sure enough, we tried. After the wedding was over, the next day, we got in our 2005 Chevy Malibu, and we drove to the Alpine Loop. And it was several miles up the Alpine Loop to reach the trailhead of Handy's Peak. And uh, this loop was a little difficult in a Malibu. It, a lot of rocks, cliffs, tight turns. But don't let me describe it for you. Let me give you a picture. Put that up on the screen for you. Yeah, don't get too close to the edge. It's going to be a rough day. So this is a, a picture from Cinnamon Pass on the Alpine Loop. And so we get up there and we start going up this thing in the Chevy Malibu. And I'm in the passenger seat. My dad is driving because, you know what, this is his rental. If we're going to tear the bottom out from underneath the car, he didn't like to be, at least like to be the one who did it. So we're driving up. I'm giving him tips. He's driving the car. He's gripping that steering wheel super tight as we go over rocks and ditches and around cliffs and such. We finally make it to a point on the trail where uh, the road is basically just this big rock. That's slanted that you have to drive up to get to the rest of it. So my mom and I get out of the car. Dad takes this Malibu up the side of the rock. It was epic. I wish I had taken a picture. They put, should have put it in the commercial for the Malibu. This thing goes up the side of the rock. He gets all the way to the top. And then he pulls over to the side of the road and says, We can't keep doing this. I'm not going any further in this car. And so we parked the car. And we began to hike all the way to the trailhead. But it was still about two miles so before we ever reached the trail, we had to hike two miles just to get to the start of the trail. Well, we made it all the way there, made it to the trailhead, hiked many miles up to the top of Handy's Peak, then hiked all the way back down, and we were thoroughly exhausted because we had to add multiple miles onto the trip. We were exhausted, tired. My mom had turned her ankle, so she wasn't walking too good. The sun was going down, and we had miles to go to get back to the car. I thought, how are we ever going to make this? There's just no way we'll ever get there and get back home. And so I decided to do the only thing that came into my mind to do, and that was to take my hand and stick out a thumb. Do a little hitchhiking. See if somebody might come along and pick us up. And before long, a Jeep Cherokee came rumbling down the road, saw my thumb, pulled over and said, you need a ride? And I said, do we ever? I piled in the back. My parents piled in the front. And fortunately, they drove us the several miles back to our Malibu where we could then drive out and arrive safely home. You can try to do this life all on your own. It's difficult. There's a lot of sharp turns rocks and bumps on the way. 
And you could do it all on your own. But at the end of the day, you'll end up like we ended up that day. After that long hike in, that hike to the top of the mountain, and that hike back down. Exhausted, weary, injured, wondering if you're going to make it all the way home. But there's good news here. Jesus comes along. Not in a Jeep Cherokee, but he comes along. And if we see our need and we recognize his help, he will pick us up and take us all the way safely home. You see, Jesus didn't collapse exhausted on the road of life. He collapsed exhausted on the cross where he gave his life for you and for me. Where he perfectly did what we could not. He lived the perfect life we could not live. He met God's standard perfectly and he went to the cross where he traded his perfect record for our sin. So that when we come to him, we can find ultimate rest in what he accomplished for us. On the cross, what did Jesus say? He said, it is finished. It is done. You and I do not have to do to get what matters most in life. Because he has already done it. All that we have to do is stick out our thumb and say, can I get a ride, Jesus? And he'll pick us up. And he'll take us safely home through this life to heaven and beyond. But are you resting in him today? Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Stand together. And let's pray. This morning, Jesus is offering you rest. But it begins by putting your faith and trust in Him. By turning from your sins and acknowledging to God, I cannot live up to your standard. I cannot perfectly follow all of your commands. But today, I want to trust the one who did. And so today can be the day where you turn from your sins and for the first time place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. It says in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So this morning, you can make that decision and trust in him. But secondly, maybe you're here and the road of life has worn you out. You've been trying to achieve, meet expectations, live up to standards, and it's been exhausting. Jesus is standing there and he's inviting you to come and find rest in him. He's done it. He's performed perfectly so that we don't have to. And today, when you receive that gift, It's better than any beach vacation. It's better than any screen. It's better than sleeping in. It's a rest that never fades and never fails. For now and for all eternity. Maybe today you just need to come and receive it. Say, Lord, you did it. Help me to let go of having to do it all myself. Father, we thank you today for the rest that is found only in Jesus. I pray, Lord, that we would take advantage of it on this holiday season. Lord, that we would know that you are gentle and lowly and that in you we will find rest for our souls. Help us to take your yoke upon you for your yoke is easy and your burden is light. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.